So I paint a lot of models. Shocker, I know. But one thing I've been wanting to delve into is setting those models into a specific scene. That's one of the reasons I love basing so much. Every mini is its own diorama. That's not just a mini, it's an ultramarine trekking through a ruined city. A raptor sneaking through the jungle. A necron wandering through a psychedelic forest. That's what the base does for your minis. It gives them some context, it gives them a situation. But once you get those suckers on the board, well, there can be some incongruities. I'm pretty good at mentally photoshopping those problems away, but still, when your dusty desert orcs are trekking through the tundra, or your fantasy goblins are walking through a sci-fi city, it's not helping your models look their best. So the solution is display boards. I've seen tons of people make display boards. It's a little scene that shows off the environment of your models perfectly. It's a super superfluous thing for weirdo perfectionists like myself. And surprisingly popular with competitive players. I guess to flex a little bit of creativity while also providing some plausible deniability that those three contemptor dreadnoughts with twin Volkite disintegrators are in the list for lore reasons and not just game breaking cheese. I have a lot of different models with a lot of different basing schemes, so I'm gonna need a lot of boards. I reached out to Army Painter with this idea and they sent me every single one of their terrain kits. So let's see what we can do. I started out with the Game Master Dungeons and Caverns core set. It came with the most stuff, and I want to use some of this stuff going forward into the other builds. I wasn't planning on using this phone, but it is nice. It gives me some ideas. What I really wanted out of this box was not the instructions I don't know how to read. This hot foam cutter. I've never actually used one of these before. This thing seems rather sketchy. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. Ooh, ooh. Seems like this might cut through the foam a little bit too easily, but we'll see. I've never made a display board before, so I'm sure I'm gonna learn a lot. It's different from a game board. I have more freedom when it comes to decorating and embellishing because there's less room to work with, so I can jam pack the details. I want any mini standing on it to look great regardless of terrain. I got my shape all cut out. It is 12 inches by seven inches by 10 inches. I want about 10 models to be able to comfortably fit on this display board. And I smashed in a little bit of texture with this brick I found in my backyard. And I have five of these things. This is gonna be epic. And the texture is already done. I just have to build it all. To start this dungeon board off, I burnt some depressions into the ground. The foam is rigid, but easy to work with. And in no time, I had lots of big old bricks without having to cut, stack, and glue hundreds of loose bricks together. The thing I wanted out of my dungeon was layers. The more stuff I can get on here, the more interesting the final product will be. And more details means more things to paint. Even though the board is made from scraps and garbage, I want a lot of garbage because it means more options. I built up the back and sides of this board to give me a backdrop. I'm thinking of how this model will look in photos and when people hold it up to their faces. I want you to see my board not just underneath the minis, but behind it too, a full portrait, so nothing is left up to the imagination of the viewer. Just my models and my world surrounding it. And a dungeon setting is a perfect excuse for creating layers of debris and interest. The foam has a texture, but I want more. Texture paste, sprinkling of rocks and sand, a little jewelry chain. I dumped everything and anything I could think of into the scene and squared watered down glue everywhere to lock it in place. And scene number one is finished. I couldn't decide if it was a dungeon or a sewer, so it's a sewer dungeon, and it turned out really nice. This thing was actually super helpful for cutting out all of the bricks, although I also used my soldering iron to do a lot of the detailed work. But yeah, I like it. It's a little bit hokey, a little Scooby-Doo, but I'm sure when it comes time to painting, I can correct that. But I can't paint right now because it has a thick, wet, layer of Mod Podge, so I gotta let that dry. So it is time for Snow and Tundra Terrain Kit. Once again, instructions. And snow, sand, a bunch of different tufts. Ah, fake grass. And just what any snowy terrain needs, some barbed wire. The Arctic is a tricky thing. You can go a lot of different ways with it. Desolate landscape, snow-covered cobblestone, Arctic water full of floating ice. I decided I wanted spiky glaciers. I've walked past ice spikes sticking out of the ground in most of the video games I've ever played, but never in a war game, so I need to make that happen. And with my new favorite tool, the hot wire foam cutter, I got to screw around and make all sorts of jagged spike shapes. It was wild, like drawing in 3D. I've made dungeons before, but natural stuff is pretty new to me, and I was having a blast just gluing stuff down willy-nilly, not being too careful, it's nature, it should be a little chaotic. If your hands are getting dirty, you know you're on the right track. The Arctic world. I was originally thinking of doing just a normal battlefield with some snow on it, but then I decided to go full hog into snow planets. My idea was that this planet goes through rapid cycles of cooling and warming, and so 
the glaciers meet and crash against each other and send sharp spikes of ice up into the sky. I think that's something that happens a little bit more in science fiction than in reality, but I think it looks very neat. However, it has to dry, so maybe I do a 180 and pivot to a little bit of a desert biome. Ooh, instructions. Yeah, we got some crumbly pieces of cork. And some more tufts. Yeah. And sand. Desert is interesting because in my head it should be flat, but I want a backdrop for my minis to stand in front of, so I decided to go with where the desert meets the mountains. And foam is perfect for mountains. The board ended up being basically the same building steps as the ice world, but because of how flexible foam is as a material, chaining up the techniques completely changed the look of the final product. A million little slices into the foam makes a good fake slate rock, and a combination of sculpted mold plaster and a sprinkling of army painter battlefield debris makes a great shredded cliff face. Chunks of rock have been breaking away and tumbling down the mountains, and one day all that'll be left is a sea of sand. The wasteland is complete. It's like Morpheus said, welcome to the desert of the real. Although my desert is a literal desert. I really like the battlefield rocks. I might need to get a restock on those because I use up the entire baggie and that is a thick layer of sand. Hopefully the watered down Maj Podge is good enough to keep that stuck down. But as I set that aside to dry, it is time to move on to ruins and cliffs. Instructions. Ah, static grass. I don't have any concrete ideas for what cliffs should look like. They're not a terrain like snow and deserts are. There's all sorts of different cliffs out there. Like white cliffs, green cliffs, orange cliffs, smooth cliffs, jagged cliffs, scary cliffs, tropical cliffs, old cliffs. I want to make my cliffs look different. My ice world is smooth and my desert world is layered, so I decided to go jagged with the cliff board. And I discovered sawing the one inch foam in half gave me just the right texture. It was slow going, carefully gluing the pieces into place while attempting to not burn my fingers. I successfully got the rocks right where I wanted them, but I was not as successful at keeping my fingers safe. And a sprinkling of slate rock here and there rounded out the bill nicely. The cliff board, not to be confused with the cliff bar, although the texture is very similar, is done. Made of all the same materials, but I was able to get a really cool texture using this drywall knife. Now I gotta let this dry and the only board left is... Wilderness and Woodland Terrain. Oops. Oh no, the instructions! I know my way around a forest, being from the American Midwest. It's basically one big forest, and Chicago. So I decided to freeform it. I smothered the board, placing pieces of pine bark nuggets here and there to show some rocks poking out from around the earth. The other boards are all pretty flat, which makes sense for them, but a forest should have curves. I'm happy with the bumpy ground, so some twigs from my backyard should round out the forest board nicely. The forest base is finished. I am in love with this new material I've been using called sculpt mold It's not new, but it's new to me. And this is gonna be a fun experiment to see if one inch of sculpt mold will ever, ever dry. And I have plenty of time to let it dry because now it's time to paint all these suckers. I'll save this one for last. Going back to the dungeon board, I think what I'm gonna do is I built each of these using Army Painter's Game Master boxes. So I'm gonna limit myself to only the colors provided in each Game Master box. Limiting myself color-wise has led to a lot of success in the past, so it'll be an interesting experiment. And speaking of Warmaster paints, Army Painter is known far and wide for their wide range of hobby products and competitive pricing. Based in Denmark, but now sold all over the world, I would bet every hobbyist out there has one or two Army Painter products kicking around in their hobby bins. Army Painter isn't just for miniature wargamers though, they also have a wide assortment of offerings for role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons. These Warmaster boxes are all aimed at helping dungeon masters and players alike build their campaigns in real life out of foam, sand, glue, and paint. And they have officially licensed D&D paints. Where else can you find colors like Purple Worm, Underdark Indigo, or Flump Pink? In the Warmaster range, there's a series of paint sets like the Game Master Character Paint Set, which comes with 20 different colors of paint and five snap-fit plastic miniatures. So there doesn't have to be any pause between opening the box and getting paint on plastic. It also comes with a brush on primer, so you don't have to face the elements and travel outside to get your miniatures ready for painting. The Army Painter is a wonderful resource to have in the miniature painting sphere, and thanks again for sponsoring this video. The starter box comes with a lot more colors than the other boxes, so this board should end up looking very interesting. And each box comes with a spray paint can, but not a normal spray paint can. This is a water-based acrylic paint, so it won't melt the foam. The boards really came to life after getting a base coat. This stuff is wild. It's just like spraying a big wet layer of acrylic paint out of my airbrush. And it is big and wet, so it's gonna take a little while to dry, maybe five, 10 minutes. So I think I'm just gonna go ahead and spray them all in their respective colors now, so I don't have to wait later. 
What was silly looking foam before, now looks like real environment. Although I still think I'm gonna wait to base coat the forest display. I want that plaster to be bone dry before I mess with it. I put every color that comes in the box into the brush and sprayed it on, highlighting all the details of the foam. A little dry brushing in the board was looking dark and dank. Then it was picking out the details. A combination of green wash and light green paint mixed together made for some great Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle green ooze coming down off the sewer grates and walls. It was a nice pop of color in an otherwise dark board. The dungeon is done. Four more to go. Moving on to the Arctic base. So the palette I have is white, a green wash, a blue wash, turquoise, and I never would have thought of this, but a pearl paint, like a shimmery white, which is kind of genius because snow glitters. And so I'm really excited to spray a little bit of this all over the board and see what happens. This was fun. Any color pops on top of white, especially turquoise. In no time at all, the base was looking cold. I may have overdone the turquoise in my excitement, but not to worry as painting is an additive process. I dialed it way back with some more white paint, leaving the tips of the spikes and the ground white. Now Army Painter included two washes, a green and a blue, so I have to make these work. I squirted green all over the base in each spike, and it does do a little something something to make it look more natural. It changes up the blue color and makes for a really nice subtle color that it didn't have before. And the blue wash did what blue washes do. It shaded all the little cracks and crevices in the foam. I hosed down everything with blue. Any little imperfection of carving became much needed texture. And once again, I got carried away with color. What can I say? I like putting down paint. The colors were overpowering the details, so a little white dry brushing brought everything back to white. With a little dusting of pearl, everything started to glitter. It looked magical and kind of gave a fake gloss finish, where it was shimmery but not shiny. And to finally add some snow to the Arctic base, I coated the ground in Mod Podge and dumped snow all over it. A big wet coat of watered down glue to seal it all in place and the board was complete. The ice is done! Ugh, ice planets are so easy. I want to do a whole board like this, just four colors. I could probably get it knocked out in an afternoon. I wonder if the desert's going to be just as easy. For this board, I got really light tan, medium light tan, and tan. A brown wash, and orange. My kind of colors. I love orange. It's a color I don't see much in minis, so I tend to overuse it when I get the chance to do it. And it did a great job of adding contrast to the recesses without actually darkening them down a bunch. This is the desert. Everything should be bright and sunny, but I still want lots of contrast, so this palette worked really well. Everything is bright, but you can easily see where the different materials start and stop. And no desert would be complete without dry brushing. One negative of dry brushing is that it can leave a dry and dusty look on your minis. Did I say dry and dusty? Sounds just right for the desert. Using the lightest tan, every foam mountain and grain of sand got a highlight. To finish the mountains, I poured the brown wash straight into the foam and worked it in with a brush. It pooled in all the cracks and crevices and made it all stand out. And you know what else stands out? That's right, our Patreon. Over there we have new STL train packs available monthly. This month we have the Wasteland cars ready to drive donuts across the board. And to new patrons, we have a welcome pack that includes Dawn of War inspired Space Marine, Imperial Guard, and Eldar Terrain, all hosted by Comics, Games, and Things. We make weekly exclusive videos reviewing our patrons' minis and host Discord hangouts and painting PDF guides. And a new tier where you can join the ranks of my Black Templar Legion. The desert is done, and it's looking hot, like the colors exist in the warm spectrum. And I just love putting on grass tufts for two reasons. One, because it instantly makes the model look a lot more realistic, and number two, because it means I'm almost done. Next up is the cliffs. For the cliffs, what I have to work with is gray, a very similar looking gray, light tan, a red that's a little magenta-y, and black wash. We'll see. I don't immediately see what Army Painter was going for with this palette, but I'm just gonna go for it. Airbrushing on gray and then the other gray left a nice complexion. The colors have a lot of green and brown in them and makes it feel very natural. And a heavy dry brushing of tan was perfect for the super high texture I sculpted into the foam rocks. It brightened things up a lot while keeping it a little dark and dour and tufts. I love tufts. I think these little bushes look lovely snuck in between the rocks. I left the magenta red out of the rocks because instead I want it to be blood. I dipped my toothbrush into this color and slid my fingers over the bristles so it would spring back and fleck blood all over the place. And the cliffs are done. I was a little dubious of the color choices, but I think they actually worked out really nice. And the magenta is drawing a lot redder, and I think that bright, bright, bright red is making it a lot more vibrant and eye-catching than a more realistic darker red. Four down, one base to go. The colors for the woodlands are just what you'd expect. Green, slightly lighter green, a white green, a red brown and some brown ink. The board was finally dry and ready for a base coat, a nice dark green. The texture of the plaster sculpty mold makes for a very convincing earth, and the green and ever so slightly lighter green made for decent grass. The white green was my contrast maker. Heavy dry brushing over everything slightly desaturated everything, but have you ever seen the Midwest? 
everything is desaturated. But a brown wash really made the details shine while giving the earth that real life texture. And speaking of texture, I was riding high after the blood spatter, so a sprinkling of green. I applied a little sand. If I had dark sand, I would have used it, but if I go sparingly, the tan sand shouldn't be too disruptive. And this set came with some lovely swampy tufts and pieces of dried moss, which looked good, although a little bit artificial. So after they were all stuck on there, I went in with the original base color of my airbrush and dusted this over the top of all the foliage. A little bit more green here and there, and the woodlands were finished. It's done. They're all done. Now I get to put some models on them. This project brought me right back to my college days, where I studied scenic design and a little architecture, and I created so many little dioramas. And now my models have lots of perfect little locations to show them off in. I love my miniatures, and I often just stand there and look at them, and these boards are like the wargaming version of a Barbie playhouse. I can populate these with the appropriate minis, and they all look especially good. I now have five lovely display boards. And one thing I didn't think about before starting this project, but most of my minis are either set in like an industrial factory or a yellow desert, which is none of these boards. I got so wrapped up in the challenge of whether I could, I didn't stop to think if whether I should. But I still really like these boards, especially the ice one. The ice one might be my favorite. It was super easy to do, especially with the foam cutter, and it really, really looks nice. Don't be surprised if in the near future you don't see some sort of an ice planet build for an entire game board, but I am really excited about these display boards and I can't wait to spend the entire afternoon just putting different models on these boards and just taking a look at them. Thanks for watching.